everyone. Today we have Dr. Daniel F. Kelly, the president and CEO of Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation. Dr. Kelly is a world-renowned neurosurgeon and also the director of the Pacific Brain Tumor Center and Pacific Pituitary Disorder Center. He's also a professor of neurosurgery at St. John's Cancer Institute. His focus is in the field of minimally invasive surgery for brain, pituitary, and skull-based tumors. He's been awarded the Southern California Super Doctors Distinction 15 years in a row and a multiple recipient of the Patient's Choice Award. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Wonder Podcast, Dr. Kelly. Thanks, Kalika. Happy to be here. So how does a physician become an entrepreneur? Tell us your origin story. Oof. It wasn't planned out, I'll tell you that. You know, my first faculty position was at UCLA. I went there in uh, 1993 as a junior faculty and started developing a brain tumor program and a pituitary tumor practice. And over time, it grew and it thrived. And I spent a lot of time at the county hospital at Harbor UCLA as well. And, you know, was deep in that world of, you know, academic neurosurgery, training residents and fellows. and. Um, over time, as you know, things things evolved around 2005. I started thinking about potentially doing something a little different, having a little more independence, a little more self control, a little more entrepreneurial edge. And so I learned about the Saint uh, the John Wayne Cancer Institute, uh, which is at Saint John's Health Center in Santa Monica, and they um, had a, a wonderful training program, a fe surgical fellowship training program and a beautiful hospital, it seemed like a great opportunity. And so I looked at that and after about two years of negotiating and working through things, I made the move and I left UCLA and joined St. John's and the John Wayne Cancer Institute to help them develop essentially a brain tumor program and a neuro-oncology program. And how did you get from there to Pacific Neuroscience Institute? Good question. So initially I was there, you know, pretty much by myself. I had a fellow. I started working with Chester Griffiths, an ENT, and Howard Krauss, a neuro-ophthalmologist. We started working a lot together. We started developing more of a sort of combined program. They had been there for many years as well. And then we met Dr. Santosh Kayseri, who's a neuro-oncologist at the time he was at UCSD. And he was very interested in also making a jump out of the UC, which had been very good to both of us, but we were looking for something different and a little more independence. And so we recruited uh, Dr. Kayseri and he joined us in 2015. By that time, I already had a junior partner, Dr. Barkadarian, Dr. Griffiths had a junior partner. And over time, we developed the concept of Pacific Neuroscience Institute. So in, in a sense, we sort of butted off of the Cancer Institute because we were starting to do other things beyond cancer-related things. A lot of the tumors that I treat are benign tumors. They're not cancers. Um, we had an ENT practice with Dr. Griffiths. Uh, we started to develop a stroke and neurovascular program, a hydrocephalus program, facial pain program, and really didn't fit well into the traditional Cancer Institute model. So P&I was formed, was hatched. And in 2017, we formed what's called a, a professional services agreement with Providence Health. And at that time, in, in September 2017, when we started with the PNI Medical Group, we were 17 docs in the medical group. And now, here in 2023, we're uh, almost 40 docs. So we've had a tremendous growth, more centers of excellence. We have a much bigger footprint now. We're not just at St. John's in Santa Monica. We're at Little Company of Mary in Torrance. We're at St. Joseph's in Burbank, at Holy Cross, further up in the valley. And we have some extensions in some programs, such as neuro-oncology, down into Orange County. So we've had a lot of growth over the last five and a half years. Wow, that's a lot of growth in less than six years. How did it happen? I know you have a lot of co-founders. Was it because of your complementary skills or what's the secret? You know, I think it's delivering on what you say you're going to do and having a game plan that's reasonable, that fits in well with the bigger game plan, you know, working with a very large Catholic healthcare system like Providence. They have, I think, 51 hospitals you know, they have kind of their way of doing things. In many ways, they facilitated a lot of this sort of entrepreneurial spirit much better than, say, the University of California could. 
And we accomplished a tremendous amount with this partnership of Providence, and they've been very good partners. But I think also, you know, the core group, the founders of the group, Dr. Kayseri, Dr. Griffiths, Dr. Kraus, and myself, I think we have kind of shared goals. We all come from different specialties, neuro-oncology, neurosurgery, ENT, and neuro-ophthalmology. We're a very unique beast, and the chemistry has just been good. We've been very fortunate to recruit some amazing you know, faculty across ENT, neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, neuro-ophthalmology, our stroke doctors, neurointerventionalists, psychiatrists, addiction medicine, a whole bevy of neurologists that are involved in things such as multiple sclerosis and brain health movement disorders. So we've been very careful. I think one of the advantages that we had that we created the group from nothing. So we weren't sort of an old fossilized academic department. It's all created from nothing. And and having, you know, a, a pretty extensive background in academic development and training and doing research and clinical trials. You were talking a lot about how you really had a lot of success by getting a lot of neurologist and people is really hard when it comes to entrepreneurship. How do you attract the right people to your organization? I, th- I think, you know, we, we have been very fortunate in recruiting a lot of top, top-notch people who also, many of them had some of the similar frustrations in academia, not all of them, but who wanted to do something different and wanted sort of a new model. And this is a different model. There's really nothing quite like p and anywhere in the country. We're a unique beast. And we've had tremendous growth and it's, you know, like I said, we've been very fortunate in the people that we've, that we've selected and we've surrounded ourselves with a lot of talented people across the neuroscience spectrum. And, you know, our motto, you know, is care under one roof. So for example, in our brain tumor population or pituitary or skull-based tumors, a patient can come into our P&I clinic and they can be seen by the neurosurgeon the ENT, the neuro-ophthalmologist, and the endocrinologist all in one visit. And that's very hard to con- to accomplish at most academic medical centers. And so we bring that sort of, you know, model that is very patient-centric. And I think that has, you know, generated a lot of, a lot of goodwill and people like it and referring doctors like it. We're also very hands-on um, with our patients. We don't have a residency training program. We do have fellowship training program, but they do get, they get us, you know, they're not layers of people. They get the doctors. And I think people also like that. And, you know, I, our relationship with Providence, as I mentioned, has been, has been very good. And I think we, we are considered the lead neuroscience group for all of Southern California Providence. And, and even to some degree for the bigger system, I think we have the most um, by far, we have the most comprehensive offering across all these areas from, you know, from brain health to brain tumors. And so they look f- to us for some leadership in that area as well, which we've been doing. I often also see that the secret of success for a lot of organization is trust. You know, there's an extraordinary power when it comes to being able to trust your employees, trust your co-founders. How has trust played how has that quality played in, in your practice? Well, I think it's, again, going back to this idea of, of delivering on what you say you're going to do and, and knowing that, you know, that you can accomplish these sorts of things. I think with trust, it's, it's very important to be able to deliver on what you say you're going to do. And I think over time, we have certainly built that trust with Providence and it's paid off because, you know, the synergy has been, has been excellent. I know that you've talked a lot about the successes in the past five and a half years. Where have you struggled or where have you had some issues? We love hearing this bottom 5% stories. Yeah, well, I think we have, we certainly struggled like everyone did during the pandemic. You know, that was a totally new experience for everyone. We had to s- slow down our practices. We had to, you know, just change the way the way we did things. We did in some ways, you know, make gains out of that effort. For example, we got much better at streamlining our brain tumor care because we had to. You know, we had a lot of patients who still had brain tumors who still needed surgery. 
And we already had a very low length of stay and we didn't use the intensive care unit all that often, but we even got better, better at that. And we published a paper on that called Streamlining Brain Tumor Care um, during the COVID pandemic. And we showed a very big shift in length of stay to where we were getting most of the patients out of the hospital after a brain tumor operation in one or two days and very little use of the intensive care unit. And that, that all builds upon what we've been working on for many years with our minimally invasive approaches, keyhole surgery, those sorts of things that allow us to sort of sneak in and sneak out and get the patient in and out of the hospital, hopefully, you know, with a very good operation and home soon. And, you know, during the pandemic, of course, it wasn't hard to convince patients and their families it's to say, look, you don't really need to or want to be in the hospital. You want to get home. We have many sick patients who need the beds. You'll be much better at home with your family. And most of the people, you know, buy that rationale. But it's a lot of dealing with patient expectations. But certainly the pandemic threw a big curveball at everyone. I think we're still feeling the ripple effect of that. The healthcare systems have been really hammered financially and Providence is not alone in that. And I think we've had to sort of scale down some of our growth just because, you know, the finances are not there for massive growth. And, and frankly, I don't see P&I medical group getting, you know, a lot, lot bigger. I think we're at a, a a size we can barely manage. And if it were go, to go much over, you know, 50 people, 50 docs, I think it would be, be a little too much. Yeah. How did you handle the, I guess, the mental health? We saw it all in the news. So it, like actually one of my friends is terrible. Like one of the nurses that I know, you know, jumped off the Almana building, you know, because she was just, you know, inundated with pressure. Did you have any type of issues like that during during COVID? Well, we didn't, you know, I don't think we had any suicide attempts. You know, I think we we did have suffer some physician burnout. We had a few few docs who got COVID very badly. I actually got it myself six months after my vaccination, got pretty sick. Uh, we had one of our docs who was in the ICU for a while and, you know, he survived. But I think the mental toll has been big on, on a lot of people, particularly the, the nursing staff. And, you know, we had in, I think it was December 2020 and January 2021 was when we had this horrible spike, if you remember back then. And we just, just pretty much ran out of beds. We had an overflow ICU set up out in, the, in one of the plazas outside the hospital. We never really had to use it, but we were very close. And I think that, you know, the whole ICU team, the nursing staff, the ER people, there was just a lot of, it was very hard on everyone, but, you know, we, we survived and I think everyone's better for it. I think everyone learned a lot from the pandemic. And, you know, I think Winston Churchill said, never, never let a good crisis go to waste. And, you know, we certainly tried to act on that concept and, tried to make things better. I think everyone learned a huge amount from the pandemic and how unprepared we were for something like that. So hopefully we'll never get caught so unprepared again, but we'll see because who knows what, you know, mother nature, what kind of curveball she's going to throw at us. Right. You'll be ready. So what are the habits that you have to help you juggle all your multiple roles? You're the, the president and CEO of p &I, directors of several different centers. How do you do it all? Well, I I try to um, I try to exercise regularly, pretty much every day. I have a meditation practice that could be better, but I do that every morning. I stretch every morning. I do a lot of intermittent fasting, which keeps me sharp. I think because when I if I eat a big lunch, I just want to take a nap, so that just doesn't work. I usually eat a couple meals a day. You know, I, I listen to a lot of music. Like I said, I run. I run pretty regularly, although I recently injured my meniscus. And I'm recovering from that, but it's getting better. So I, hopefully we'll be back doing that. The other important thing, I think, is sleep. And um, it's something that I've gotten a, much more attuned to after reading Matthew Walker's book on why we sleep, which came out, I think, in 2017. And Great book. 
Yeah, heard a couple podcasts, and um, it's really such an undervalued uh, commodity. And and I think that when you're not sleeping well, everything else kind of goes to hell. So I think actually getting seven and a half hours, seven to eight is really essential. And I, you know, the days when I was a, a resident or a young attending at UCLA, getting three or four hours a night for a couple nights in a row, and then, you know, rarely more than six or seven. I can't do that anymore. And um, and I don't think it's good for anyone. I mean, the data would suggest it's not good for anyone. So I, I, I think just, just making sure that you're sleeping uh, seven or eight hours a night most of the time is is probably one of the very best things you can do for your health, not just your your brain health, but your bodily health, because everything just starts to fall apart with chronic sleep deprivation. So I think that's another really important thing to have, you know, a game plan for. Yeah. And they say that, you know, with lack of sleep may lead to dementia or Alzheimer's, et cetera. So yeah, I completely agree. I love that book. Really, really fantastic. Absolutely. You also you also have a brain lifestyle uh, center now or program. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, because as entrepreneurs, we're always trying to figure out how to optimize our brain. Yeah, well, you know, we started the Brain Health Center back in 2018 with the idea we wanted to help focus on on you know memory and aging gracefully and avoiding dementia and that sort of thing and getting into other things such as depression, anxiety, addiction. We were very fortunate that we got a, a very large donation, a $40 million gift from the Singletons, from Will and Carrie Singleton. And this is through St. John's Health Center Foundation, which is our philanthropic partner. And a lot of the PI success, you know, is in due, due to philanthropy. But that um, we started the Brain Health Center, and then we were able to get this gift in early 2020, right as the pandemic uh, started, I think. And that really gave us a lot of fuel to, to further expand that program under Dr. Merrill, David Merrill. He's a, a geriatric psychiatrist. And we really had some great success in, in combining things like exercise with cognitive tasks, and we call it a fit brain. And it's a it's a program that we that we um now have. And we've also we've developed sort of a a uh, a lifestyle program, as you said. Uh, through the PNI Foundation to help uh, to offer that to people. Um, so we have a couple ways that people can come in through the medical group access or through the PNI Foundation, and really just training things to do, training people in terms of in terms of diet, exercise, reading, sleep, all of those things, cognitive tasks, socialization, all those things that are essential to allow people to kind of keep their brain stimulated and going and going in the right. The right direction. So we've we've um, we're very excited about that program, and and it's um, it's it's really the the lifestyle program itself is is new and is just really starting to to take off. We have a lot of listeners l listening globally. If they're not here in Los Angeles, how could they benefit from all the information that you're you're sharing? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure the, you know, currently the, the lifestyle program is, is a, you know, is an in-person event, but we do our, within our brain health center, we do a lot of telehealth visits. Our, our neurologists and our psychiatrists do a lot of telehealth visits and the neuropsychologists. And so that is possible. If they go on the website, they, they can still, you know, receive care and, and be evaluated, I think, even if they're in, you know, wherever, Hong Kong, Europe, et cetera. And you have a lot of patients coming from all over. What draws them to your practice? Uh, you mean the my practice personally or the... p and in general. Well, I, th I think that we, um, you know, we have worked on on developing our our brand the pni brand in neuroscience we have a great marketing team including including yourself and zara jathani and we put a lot of things out there that we're doing that i think are are somewhat unique and novel and within you know within brain tumor it's it's our minimally invasive approach to all types of brain tumors you know in brain health it's our fit brain program and the lifestyle program 
you know, we have a new cochlear implant program for young kids that Dr. Courtney Volker is doing. And we, and, you know, so we have a lot of things like that, that are not entirely unique. You know, there's a lot of great neuroscience centers out there, but I think we, we try to distinguish ourselves in that we're, we are, a, we are a unique model and we, we do, I think, provide really good uh, care for patients. And I, I think the word on that, is just sort of getting out there. So we, we were very happy to see new patients from anywhere. What are you most looking forward to this year? I think what I'm most looking forward to is the, the things that are going on in our TRIP program, Treatment and Research in Psychedelics. It's led by Dr. Keith Heinzerling. We've, um, we've com completed two clinical trials already, one for alcohol use disorder and another for major depression, both with psilocybin. And that's in collaboration with the USONA Institute. Um, we currently have a, a trial going on of, uh, uh, with LSD for generalized anxiety disorder. And um, there will be publications coming out of those first two trials with psilocybin in the near future. Um, we look forward to completing the, the uh, anxiety trial. This is a multi-center trial, and that will take a while. Um, but we're, we're just excited about the growth in that program and um, how I think that is going to be a sort of a transformative therapy available for many people with all sorts of mental health things from depression to anxiety to addiction. And um, there's just a lot of potential for, for growth there. So I'm, I'm very excited about the, the TRIP program. To, for a lot of people who aren't familiar with psychedelics, even though it has been out, maybe you can give a little background on, on TRIP and why it's important. Right. So, um, you know, psychedelics have been around for millennia, thousands of years. Um, they were actually very big in the 50s and 60s um, after Albert Hoffman discovered LSD serendipitously and they figured out the structure of psilocybin that is the component in magic mushrooms. And it was widely used in psychiatry in, the, in Europe and the United States up until 1970, approximately, when the Controlled Substances Act um, came into place because of all the counterculture issues and around the Vietnam War. And it all basically went in the deep freeze for about two decades. And then um, slowly, um, some very intrepid um, researchers and clinicians just knew that there was something there and, and um, they started this research up again. And slowly but surely, places like Johns Hopkins and NYU, um, Imperial College London started doing these studies again. And, and um, over the last 20 plus years, they've made tremendous advances showing that, that there's super significant potential for treating things like depression, anxiety, and addiction, and PTSD um, with psychedelic-assisted therapy. And so that would include psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA. Those are the three most, most being looked at right now. And in fact, MDMA, also commonly referred to as ecstasy, is the furthest along. They've actually completed three phase three trials for PTSD. And uh, MDMA will probably be rescheduled to where it is a prescribable treatment um, sometime in 2024. And so that'll be a, a huge shift. Psilocybin clinical trials for major depression are just entering the phase three studies now. They've had some very successful phase two studies, both for major depression and treatment resistant depression. And um, it will probably be another three years or so hopefully not much longer than that, till we can actually use psilocybin-assisted therapy for um, things like depression and potential anxiety and, and, and alcohol use disorder. So it's a, it's a game changer, you know, and it's a fundamental sort of paradigm shift in the way we treat things and getting away from the daily pharmacopoeia that people typically do for anxiety and depression, taking a pill every day. This is more a, a sort of psycho-spiritual expansive approach to um, trying to generate uh, neuroplasticity in your brain, allowing people to get out of their recursive loops, their rumination, 
and think about their problems and their, their issues and their relationships in a new way. And that's what psychedelics with, with you know, psychotherapy along the way seems to facilitate. And, and that's why it's so exciting because it's a it's completely different um, model than what is typically done um, now with, with pharmacologic interventions. So we're, we're excited about it. You've gotten some great support, for instance, with Louis Schwarzberg, who's the director of Fantastic Fungi. How has he supported TNI? Yeah, so our relationship with Louis uh, started back in 2019, just after we recruited Dr. Heinzerling, and we we went to a um, a conference at USONA in 2019 in March or in May, I believe, and that was right when Fantastic Fungi was coming out. And Louis was a guest speaker, gave a great talk, and I went down and introduced myself to him. And it turns out Louis knows my brother very well, who worked for National Geographic for many years. They're good friends, and we hit it off, and we started talking, Keith and I and Louie, and, um, you know, Louie has all this amazing cinematography of, you know, time-lapse and slow-mo and extreme close-ups, and um, we started thinking about doing our first clinical trial um, with psilocybin, and Keith, being an addiction medicine specialist, thought that alcohol use disorder would be a good place to start because there's some good literature on both psilocybin and LSD for psilocybin, I mean, for, for alcoholism. And then we started thinking about Louis having this visual healing um, uh, concept of, the, the, of how nature can enhance the way people feel, you know, going out on a hike and doing things in nature make people feel better in his movies can do the same thing, particularly when you watch them on a very large, large screen. And so we, we put together a clinical trial in which patients would watch a, a curated Louis movie of about 40 minutes before their, as, as they took their psilocybin at the, at the beginning of their journey. And the journey being, you know, five or six hours that would just kind of help them with the launch and the liftoff. We called it the liftoff. And um, so we randomized the patients to get the visual healing at the beginning of the trip or that they would just, you know, take the pill and put the eye shades and music, go to music right away. And um, we haven't published the results yet, but um, suffice it to say, both, both protocols actually worked very well for reducing drinking behavior, improving their drinking behavior. And um, it's been a, a really nice collaboration with Louie, and we're going to continue to to work closely with him. So, yeah, it's been a good a good re a good partnership so far. Yeah, you attract the the best people. What type of advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur? Mm. I would say that. Um, you know, be be uh, be resourceful. Um, be detail oriented. It's very hard to do things. I, I mean, I guess if you if you're just the leader of a large group and you're just sort of the big picture person, that may work. But I, I'm I, I'm much more. I need to be in the weeds to understand things, and I think being in the weeds actually helps you um, be more creative about where the problems are and where the opportunities are. So I would say you really need to pay attention to detail. Um, you got to surround yourself with with good people that you trust. I mean, that's really sort of a, a no-brainer. Um, if you don't have good people that are smart and um, trustworthy, it will never it will never work, I don't think. Um, and I guess also be be patient. And you know, let the let the process um, play out. So those would be a few things I would say. That's really good advice because a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, really just want to get things done, do it as quickly as possible. And so that's some really good advice. If people want to get a chance to know more about PNI, how can they contact you, or what's the best way for them to hear about you? Um, well, I guess on our website, you know. Um, pacificneuro.org. Um, there's there's um, 
lots of information there about about the group. Um, as you know, we have lots of podcasts. We have lots of blogs. There's uh, across all of the different areas from you know movement disorders to hydrocephalus, facial pain, Alzheimer's disease, um, things going on in the trip program. Uh, so that's a that's a really good source. Um, my email is dkelly at pacificneuro.org. People can email me. That's okay. Um, so yeah, we're happy to um, provide more info if needed. Thank you so much uh, for spending so much time with me to talk about PNI and all this wonderful things that you're doing with Trip. I mean, it sounds so exciting. It's good stuff. We're just scratching the surface. I mean, we we have a long ways to go, and I mean, the the whole I think psychedelic assisted therapy movement has a long ways to go. Psychedelic science is really just kind of getting its second win now. And, and um, it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out over the next five to 10 years. So perhaps people can sign up for your email newsletter, listen to you or your uh, podcast, Think Neuro podcast, available yeah. everywhere and pacificneuro.org. Uh, exactly. Yes. Awesome. You know better than I do. <laughs> no, it's all good. Thanks, Dr. Kelly. Talk okay, to you soon. thanks for having me. All right. Good to see you.